Debt free is your destiny. You have caught us in the middle of a three week series called Debt Free. And I want to welcome you to Bridgeway Community Church. Would you put your hands together for the Lord and the opportunity to worship him in the house of the Lord? It's so good to see you here in Columbia, Maryland. It's good to see you in Owings Mills, Ricerstown, Maryland. Thank you for coming to the house of the Lord today. Our topic for today is legacy. Legacy. Let me pray. Lord, as we go into your word, we pray that your word would go into us. And Lord, might we live a life that we can pass on and make a difference in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Together everyone said, amen and amen. I don't want to die anytime soon. I don't plan to die anytime soon. But here's the reality in this world, that unless the Lord returns in our lifetime, which is entirely possible, and maybe these days, even probable, many of us will have to go the way of the grave. Just this week, I heard of a woman in our church who lost her 17-year-old son. He was working at a fast food place called Jack in the Box. Some of you may have heard of it. It's down south. And her son was down there uh, working, and unfortunately, toward the end of the shift, a gunman came in and robbed the place and ended up murdering her 17-year-old son. Our hearts go out to the Brannon family. Leah Brannon, a regular attender here, lost her son, Fate Brannon, in Charlotte. Pastor Jen officiated the funeral last week, and I was able to call Ms. Brannon and, and tell her that we are grieving with her. We prayed together, and uh, we offer her our condolences. 17 years old. Then you have Maynard Suazo. He was one of those six people working on the bridge, a migrant worker, and they found his body last week when the Baltimore a key bridge went down, then several of the workers went down, and then it took a few weeks, and they recovered uh, the body of Maynor Suazo. He was from Honduras, and one of the people in our church was friends with him and the family and have known him, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we have had to grieve with them, and we say to our brothers and our sisters, you know, David Escobar, who is also from Honduras at our Owens Mills, Ricerstown campus, and his wife, who's on our staff, who runs our Bridge Kids ministry there in Owens Mills, our, our sympathy to, to Maynard's family and to, your, and to your friend. But not just Maynard. Maynard was 36, married, with two children. Also, unfortunately, uh, you know, Daryl Strawberry, he, he did not pass away. Let me just say that clearly. But when he left here, remember when Daryl Strawberry was here? Remember we prayed for him on the stage? When he left here, he went to spring training camp, and right after that, he had a heart attack. And thank God he is fine. I talked to him just this week. I may see him this coming week on my travels. He wants Bridgeway to know, thank you so much for, you know, praying for me. I said, remember we prayed for you? He goes, man, thank, thank the Bridgeway body for me. So uh, he wants y'all to know he's fine. He's well. They put some stents in. He's doing good. But 62 years old. Remember I said you just never know. And so when you think about whether 17 years old or 36 years old, or in this case, uh, 62 years old, thank God he didn't pass away, but that unexpected heart attack, he was on the move, he was traveling, he wasn't expecting that at all. Just yesterday I was able to attend a funeral of somebody who's very beloved in our church, they lost their mother who was 87 years old. Chris Wall's mom, Lois Walls, passed away, and they laid her to rest uh, yesterday uh, on the Eastern Shore. And you know that Karen Walls, one of our elders' council of women. And so, uh, Lois, what a sweet woman. I never got a chance to meet her, but you know, sometimes you go to people's funerals, and you can just hear the love from their children and, and from the friends, and you can see uh, what, what that person meant. And uh, I guess they called her mama, Chris. I just want you to know... Uh, uh, we're with you. We're with your family. And he's the fifth. Let's just wave really quickly so people can see Chris. He was the fifth, and his mom used to call him number five. 
So I said, for now on, instead of calling him Chris, I'm just going to call him number five. So we love you, man. But you see, whether 17 or 87, whether you are younger or whether you are older, you never know when your last day is going to be. A friend of mine uh, was talking with me after the last uh, service of reflection. Remember last service we celebrated, uh, you know, the paying off of the debt of this building. And we're sitting back in my office this week, and we were just reflecting on the fact that neither one of us want to die now. But if we did, we would be grateful for the life that we had to live and the impact that we had. We were both overwhelmed with a sense of gratitude that God has used us. And my question is, what about you? Do you feel like you're living your life every day in a way that you can be grateful for what you have accomplished or for what you are accomplishing at this time? Do you feel good about about what you have contributed or what you are contributing in this one life you have to live? I mean, are there more places around the world that I'd like to see? Sure. Would I like to meet my adult children's spouses once they get married? Of course. Would I like to meet my unborn grandkids one day? You bet. And for me, I mean, is there one more book to be written? Is there one more sermon? to be preached? Is there one more radio show to be hosted or one more hug and kiss to give a loved one or one more episode of of Law and Order to watch? (laughs) Hey, you you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Because there are so many episodes and at the end of it, it always says Dick Wolf and my wife look at each other, that dude must be rich. My goodness. But if none of that happens, I'm incredibly grateful for all I have contributed with this one life that I've been blessed with. What about you? Friends, everyone can't say that, can they? And when you live out your purpose and your mission and you've fulfilled what God has created you to do, the way you view death, you begin to see it differently. And my goal today is to inspire you to live up to your potential and to die empty. Die empty and pass on all the good stuff. The Apostle Paul died empty. It says in 2 Timothy 4, 6, Paul says, I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. He died empty. He was poured out. He had nothing left. The Apostle Paul left it all He left it all on the field. He gave all he had. He died empty. In fact, he said like this, I I fought a good fight. I I finished the race. I, I kept the faith. What about you? Friends, don't die with more in you. The graveyard is one of the places of the most untapped potential there is. But not for you because you're not going to die with a whole lot of stuff left. You're gonna make sure that when you live, you put it all out on the field. Love hard, give hard, encourage hard. So when that day comes that none of us know when it's gonna come, we can say, we fought a good fight. We finished our race, we kept the faith. Don't die with more in you, more books to write, more love to give, more horizons to explore, more visions to achieve, more offenses to forgive. Die empty. Give it all you got. And make sure that you pass everything you've got to the next generation. And even if you've had a, even if you have a bad past, you regret some of the things you did and have done, it's okay. Start now to create a better future and legacy for yourself and for those who are coming up alongside of you and behind you. Don't worry about all the things in your past that you may have screwed up if that is indeed you. I mean, Paul messed up too. 
He actually admits that he was a really bad person, but God changed him. And I think some of you are that way. You were doing some bad things, and maybe you weren't really a good person, but God changed you. He took your hard and selfish heart, and he made it soft, and he made it selfless, and he turned you around from what you were or what you could have been to what you are. That's what happened to the Apostle Paul. He was a bad dude. He even says it. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, it says this, even though I was a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. A blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man. He goes on to say in verse 16 of that chapter, but for this reason I was shown mercy so that in me, here it is, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience. Oh, I love that. He says, I was a chief of sinners. I was the worst of sinners. So you can't tell me about having a past. And God knows that you have a past. So does the devil. But God also knows that you have a future. And so does the devil. And so Jeremiah puts it like this. God says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a what? And a future. And as you live this life, as you live this reality of your calling, and as you press into your future, you will be able to leave a legacy that you're proud of. No matter what your past is, you can start now building a future that you can indeed be proud of. You can live a life from this point on with no regrets. You can live a legacy and do legacy work right now, whether you're 17 or 87. And here's how. First, repent. First, you must actually repent of your sinful past. Tell God that you're sorry. Ask God to forgive you and start afresh. Start anew. Secondly, if you're going to have a, a legacy work that you're going to live into to live a life of purpose, then secondly, after you repent, you must, you must grow up in your faith so that you can live that purposeful life that God has for you. So you repent and you turn to God and say, God, I'm sorry. But then you say, I want to grow. I want to grow in the right direction so that I can live out the purpose that you have for me. This is where discipleship comes in. Discipleship is that process of you growing spiritually, asking God to teach you his word and to teach you how to pray and to walk with other believers, maturing in your faith so you can be equipped for every good work that God has for you. That's what discipleship is. It's the growing through time to become more mature in your faith. And you can live a life completely confident that you are absolutely immortal until you've completed the work that God has given you to do on the earth. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in another passage in Philippians 1.21. He says, for to me, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. So if I keep living, cool, I'm going to live for Christ. And if I die, and I don't know when that's going to be, 1787, that's gain because I get to go be with Christ. So either way, it's a win-win, right? That's what happens when you're in Christ. You know death may come, but you don't fear it in the same way as those who don't have any hope. And so you live for Christ on this earth, and then when you die, you live with Christ in the heavens, and so it's a win-win. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is trying to say. First, you repent. Secondly, you grow. And then thirdly, if you're going to live this life of legacy, begin to live your life on purpose. Because I began living my life for the purpose of Christ. Now I can live for Christ. Before I couldn't live for Christ. But then when I repented and then when I started growing, now I can start living for Christ, walking with him. And these are the three steps that when you set in that way, the, the legacy begins. You begin to pass on that which relates to life and purpose. 
But sometimes in church, we talk about life and purpose, but we may not talk about money. And when we do talk about money, we hear it about offerings and giving and all of that, which is a part of money and and stewardship. So all that's a part of it. But there's more to the story. In fact, how do you how do you leave a legacy with regard to money? How how do you take that area of your life and begin to pull it into the overall spiritual maturity of your walk with the Lord? Well, it's the same three steps. Repent, grow, live for Christ. Repent. For some of us, we've repented of our sins. But we haven't actually ever thought about, do I need to repent of my spins? Is money actually a part of my discipleship? Or do I see my discipleship and my maturity over here and, and, and my money over here and I give some to the Lord so that part is checked off, but this whole other area, I manage it. This is my world. So I ask God to forgive me of my sins, but when it comes to my spends, it's my decision. I'm the master of my money. I'm the master of my finances. And so instead of being the manager of God's money, I'm the master of my money. Do you see how that shift can take place? Without even knowing it. And so part of repentance is saying, Lord, well, maybe, maybe I've never brought my money under the lordship of Christ and the mastery of Christ. Maybe I've always sort of said the money thing is not under your mastery. The money thing is really under my mastery. And if I need something, I ask you to deposit stuff into that, that account over there. And if I don't have enough, I ask you to put stuff here. But do I really ask you to give me wisdom on how to manage that which you've given me? Can you imagine if the Lord gives you $300,000 a year and you don't even ask him how to spend it? I mean, is that really lordship? To make a million dollars a year and never really think that that's God's money, but it's yours because you work so hard to get it? When you didn't even have any control over the market. And if the market were to crash tomorrow, you'd be at the altar asking God to, please, Lord, give me a new retirement plan. And so what we need to do is maybe for some of us, again, this may not be all of you, but maybe for some of us, we need to repent and say, God, I not only repent of my sins, I repent of my spends. I I repent over over the fact that I thought I was the God of of my money. And I'm sorry, God. And and from this message forward, I'm going to see it as your money that I manage whether it's 30,000 or whether it's 300,000 or whether it's 3 million, it's all yours. And when I spend, I'm gonna spend in prayer. Maybe I'll just pause right now before I keep moving and just give you a second to, to ask God to forgive you if you've been the master instead of his manager. For some of you, you need, to, you need to repent of an attitude of always running. I know this is not everybody, okay? So at Owens Mills or at your house or, or in this house, I'm going to make this statement, but it doesn't mean it's you if the shoe don't fit. But for some of you, you've been running around trying to chase the next get-rich-quick scheme and idea over and over again. How has it worked for you? In the name of Jesus, stop it. Stop the get rich quick stuff. That's not for you. It's not your destiny. How about managing the money that God gives you and if he blesses you with more, you do more with it and enjoy the blessing of having it, but you're not gonna run around for everybody that's trying to give you the newest idea 
and you lose your money again. And some of you have lost a lot of money because you believed another get rich quick scheme. And for some of you, that means gambling. It's not in my notes. But God has put it in the notes in the forefront of my mind right now. Some of you are gambling. Instead of like Kevin Turpin said, taking a bet on God, you're taking a bet on roulette. I need to write that down. That was good. (laughs) I ain't got a pen, but if I did, I'd write it down. I mean, that's pretty good, ain't it? (laughs) And what happens is we we, want to put our, our, our hope in all these other schemes and and gimmicks. You know what Proverbs says? Proverbs 23, 4 says this. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have wisdom to show restraint. Okay, so maybe we pause right now. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. You want to do that? And uh, I'll just leave it for you. Go ahead and talk to God for a minute. And dear God, if I've had bad spending habits, bad financial decisions, bad stewardship, I'm sorry, God. Please forgive me, God. I want to start now thinking differently in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we said those three steps for your legacy work is the same three steps for your, for your financial work. Repent, grow, live for Christ. So the same thing with your money. Grow in your understanding of how money works and, and, and what it means to become debt-free. And then live for Christ. Start living your life on purpose for Christ, being sold out to him even when you are dealing with your money. Good stewardship, the joy of generosity, all of this comes in. And as you grow and begin to live for Christ, you begin to see that the next generation can be more godly and more generous as as they see you being godly and generous. This is something that we pass on to the next generation. The reality is some people are really Some people are so stingy. And they pass on that spirit of stinginess to their children. Do you know that? I mean, I don't know. I don't know if stinginess is a spirit. I'm just saying. You know any people that are really stingy? I mean, some of you, maybe that's you. And maybe the reason why you're stingy is because your parents were stingy. Because stingy parents give birth to stingy kids. Half your kids are bridge kids right now, stingy. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't even, I don't even know your stingy kids. Okay, no. But seriously. But you know what, you know what stingy looks like? Stingy, stingy looks like this. Isn't that what a stingy spirit looks like? I ain't giving you nothing. Mm-mm. You ain't getting nothing. Mm-mm. I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about everything. Stingy. Go to the store. Stingy. Ain't nothing wrong to looking for a deal. Some of you just stingy. You'll fight over 50 cent. <laughs> Give up the 50 cents. It's not that big of a deal. You make $100,000. Why are you fighting over that? Let somebody else make a dime. This is what stingy look like. What do, you, what do you think generous looks like? Show me. Isn't that what generous looks like? Hey, what do you think generous looks like? Look like Jesus on the cross, don't it? Don't you want to be more like Jesus? Don't be stingy. Maybe I should have titled the message that. I kind of like it. I should write that down too, but I don't have a pen. But don't be stingy. Tell your neighbor, don't be stingy. Go ahead, you can do it. Now look back at him and say, your mama's stingy. Go ahead and say <laughs> Okay, that's enough insults for the church. <laughs> you know what? Today I want to declare in this church that we will not be a stingy church ever, that we will always be a generous church. I want to declare that people in this church will be debt-free and generous. I want to declare that the joy of generosity will be your portion. We are developing cheerful givers who are excited to bless others because they themselves have been blessed. Hallelujah. 
God has blessed you to be a blessing. God will bless you to be a blessing. The more you open yourself up like this to God, the more he is ready to bless you. You can't catch a ball like this if you're a wide receiver, but if you open yourself up like this, you can catch what God has for you. Don't allow fear to keep you like this because God wants to release blessings to you, but he can't release it to you because everything about you is closed. God is saying, open it up, let it go, and watch the ball fly right down to your arms, but you got to be ready to receive. Does anybody receive that word today? One of the ways that we do this is with our finances, this generosity, and, and next week we're going to talk about creating future harvest through generosity in a message called Harvest Time. But today I just want to spend sort of the rest of our time discussing how you can uh, have a financial legacy beyond your years on the earth even beyond the years you live. What kind of legacy do you want to leave? You know, in Proverbs 13, 22, it says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Debt-free is your destiny. Here are the three things you can pass on to the next generation about money, okay? Three things you can pass on to the next generation about money. Number one, tithing to God. I mean, many believers who tithe, they were taught how to tithe by their Christian parents. A lot of tithers, they know how to tithe because their Christian parents were tithers, and they passed it on to them. And your children, your children's children, and the next generation, even if you don't have kids, when they see you tithing, then guess what? You can pass that on. And, and even if you don't uh, have young adults that tithe, They'll learn it from you when they see that you do it, and some of them have it in the bank of their memory even though they're not exercising it. But when they get older, they begin to see the wisdom, and they too will become tithers. So that's the first thing you can pass on to the next generation. Here's the second thing. Not just tithing to God, but trusting God. Trusting God with, that he will supply all of your needs. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And so the next generation needs to see a generation of older people who know how to trust God. They need to see a 21-year-old who knows how to trust God and they're 14 years old. They need to see an 18-year-old who knows how to trust God because they're 12 years old. They need to see a 36-year-old know how to trust God because they're a 26-year-old. You see, when a 26-year-old is tithing and all his other college buddies aren't tithing, they finally get to see what possibility looks like when you put your faith into action. But if every other 25 and 26-year-old is just spending their money to do whatever they want to do and they're not honoring God with their finances, well, guess what? You may do the same thing because nobody else is doing it. But what I'm calling you to do is to be the leader. Because when they see that you're trusting God with your finances— when they see that you're trusting God to supply all your needs, they're going to have a, at least one example in their friend's network of somebody who knows how to trust the Lord. And on top of that, you know, we just quoted Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. But I need to quote verse 10 to you as well, because I believe that's where you got to trust God. Verse 10 says, honor the Lord with the first fruits of your wealth. So tithe to God, trust God. Here's the last of the three uh, that you need to pass on to the next generation. That's tools for living as good stewards. And this is where it gets a little technical because in church, unless you're in a seminar, you don't usually get it in a sermon on a Sunday. But we need to teach about banking and savings and investments and small business and entrepreneurship. We need to start small funds for those who are under our care, even at a young age, so they'll have the ability to see what it looks like to see money grow. Maybe opening a bank account for a younger person and showing them actually how to write a check. Hang on, does anybody write checks anymore? You see my point? We have to actually learn new things along the way. What have we said so far? Here are the three things that you can pass on to the next generation. Tithing to God trusting God to supply your needs and tools that are out there to live as good servants. Now, I want to bring the message toward uh, the latter part by talking about the practical applications I want to give you. Let me give you a couple of them. Number one, make a decision to become debt-free by faith. Make a decision to become debt-free by faith. And I say it's by faith because you have to speak it out. You have to start saying out loud to yourself and to others, I'm becoming debt-free. Can you say that? 
I'm becoming debt free. One more time. Say it. Now, some of you are already debt free, but there are a lot of people who are not. But you can say I'm becoming debt free even when you don't see it. God can be moving in your faith because you now see it as a possibility. And every time you pay off a debt, a small debt or a large debt, every time you pay one off, celebrate. Okay, it doesn't matter how small it is. Celebrate. Amber and I just celebrated last week. She sent me a text. Honey, we just paid off this bill. It was like $6,000. We paid it off for a couple of years, and finally it got paid off. I said, girl, let's celebrate. We're going to go out to dinner and get some Korean barbecue tonight. And she said, bet. No, she didn't. She don't talk like that. But anyway, <laughs> I was so excited. And we actually went out, and, and we said, Asia, you want to go with us, our, our daughter? And she goes, no, you and mommy going on your little date. And I'm like, oh, that's so sweet, but can you bring me something back, she asked. And of course we could. <laughs> can you give us some money? Of course she didn't, but did we bring her something back? Of course we did. But here's the thing. I love to celebrate small wins. So we went out and got some Korean barbecue. And now, honestly, I don't need much to go out to celebrate a Korean barbecue. I mean, my wife would wake up in the morning and say, honey, I love you. And I'm like, you know what? I love you too. Come on, let's celebrate our love and get some Korean barbecue. I mean, that's just, that's just kind of the way I am. But, but whatever the bill is, celebrate it when you pass, when, 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 you, when you pay it off. Now, let me show you something really technical here. But okay, if you'll just go with me into the classroom mode for a second. I want to show you a scenario. Let's say you have three credit cards. You got credit card number one. You owe $1,000 on it. You got credit card number two, you owe $2,000 on it. You got credit card number three, you owe $3,000 on it. Now, the interest for that $1,000 credit card, 18%. The interest for the $2,000 credit card, 20%. The interest for the $3,000 credit card, 25%. Now, your minimum monthly payment for the $1,000 one, $25. Your minimum monthly payment for the $2,000 one, $50. And for the $3,000 one, $65. Now, in this scenario right here, if you just pay the minimum balance of $25 for that first credit card of $1,000 at 18%, it will take you, listen, 59 months. That's almost five years to pay off that $1,000 debt. In that same scenario, if you pay $25 every, uh, the, the minimum of $50 every month, if you pay that for that $2,000 debt, the second credit card, and you pay that minimum balance of 50, guess what? It'll take you five years, 60 months, to pay off that $2,000 debt. The $3,000 debt, if you just pay the minimum of $65 every month, guess how long it'll take you to pay it off? 82 months. That's almost seven years. But check this out. If you pay another $25 on any one of those, like for the $1,000 one, it's $25 minimum payment. If you add another $25 to that, instead of it taking you five years to pay off that $1,000, guess how long it'll take you? 24 months, two years. So you've cut off three years just by adding another $25. And then when you pay that off, you can take that money and apply it to the other two credit cards. And that's called the snowball method of debt reduction. I learned that from our in-house guy, Steve Maruka. And Steve Maruka and other great financial counselors in our, in our church will actually walk with you to help you figure out how to do this with your own money. Take advantage of the Bridgeway knowledge we have for you. You know, the Bible says, get wisdom. Get understanding. Wisdom doesn't just fall on you like rain. Grace can fall on you. Wisdom can't. The sunshine can shine on you. Wisdom can't. No, you have to go get wisdom. You have to go get understanding according to Proverbs 4 or 5. So go get it. And guess what? It's right here at Bridgeway. It's all in-house right here. Hashtag come home. Make a decision to become debt-free by faith. Here's a second practical application. Take advantage of all that Bridgeway has to offer. I mean, here's what Bridgeway has to offer for free. I just want you to know a couple of things. First of all, we have one-on-one -on -one mentoring for financial counseling for you. It's available at Bridgeway. Anyone who wants it at any time, we have people that are ready to mentor you one-on-one. -on -one. And we've seen so many people get this mentoring. 
And people, at, when they do this in the world, they have to pay money. They get percentages and everything else in order to get the mentoring. It's free for you. It's covered because you have professionals that are in our church that are willing to serve God by serving you. You want more information? There's an information session on this on April 16th and on April 23rd. More information, go to bridgeway.cc slash events. Or you can just send an email to care at bridgeway.cc. You say, I want financial mentoring. Send an email, care at bridgeway.cc. It's private, it's confidential, it's one-on-one. That's your church. Here's the second thing for you. Wednesday Night Alive, there's going to be a financial foundations God's Way class taught by a professional who is a part of our ministry, a friend of mine, on April 24th through May 29th during the next module of discipleship for Wednesday Night Alive, a special class that we're inserting in there called A Financial Foundation God's Way taught by expert Marcus McConnell. Again, it's free. People pay a lot of money for this. It's free. Bridgeway.cc slash events. You see, I actually believe that handling finances and handling your money is a discipleship issue. And some of us have not been discipled in this area. We'll teach you how to read the Bible and teach you how to pray, which is all good. But this is a very important part of your life, isn't it? And for people not to come up alongside of you, we ask people, hey, how you doing? Maybe you should say, what do you mean? Uh, Emotionally, spiritually, physically, or financially? Because that's such a big part of all of our lives. Here's the third and final thing. Start passing the baton while you're still living. Start passing the baton while you're still living. What wisdom do you need to give now? What leadership opportunities do you need to give now? What disciple can you raise up now? What investments can you begin to seed now? What responsibilities in ministry and business and family can you begin to give away now? You know, the baton passing is not just to your children. It may be to your siblings. It may be to disciples, protégés, or even younger colleagues. Now, what I'm going to do is I want to give an illustration on stage as I bring this to a close. And I'm going to ask Jonathan Adajo to come up, my, my assistant, because I want to talk about passing the baton. Do you all know what a baton is? Have you ever seen one, felt one, touched one? Well, clearly I haven't because I never ran track. Okay, so uh, um, uh, through the analogy, I understand it, but through the reality, it's something different. Now, Jonathan, give him a hand, by the way. Jonathan used to be a track star. Did y'all know that? He used to be a track star, right? Oh, no, not star. Not a track star. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. But, but didn't, didn't, you tr- didn't you try out like for the Olympics or something? Oh, no. Oh, no, okay, not I got quite. that wrong. Oh, you ran track like in college, at a college level. Oh, keep going down. Oh, oh, okay. Got it. I, I messed up. Okay, so high school. There you go. Okay, great, great, great. That's cool. I understand that, man. I play for the Eagles, you know? So the uh, High Point Senior High School Eagles. All right. Yeah, go High Point. All right. So, okay, but you ran track. So under, show us the concept. What does it mean to do like a relay race? Sure. So the goal is to pass the baton from one person to the other without getting disqualified, which means not throwing it, dropping it, and making sure that you do it within what's called the exchange zone, which is a 20-meter distance on the track. Gotcha. So uh, let me have that baton then. So if, if I'm running, right, right and it, this is clearly imagination. <laughs> okay, but if I'm running, <laughs> right, right, and I'm going to pass the baton, right. I'm going to turn around and hand it to you like this. No, not quite. No, what am I going to do? So you're going to extend your hand and give it to me, but the important thing is you're going to lead me because I'm going to be focused this way, right? Okay. So I don't want to look back at you. Okay, so, when so you're you, in front of me. I'm in front of you. I'm running. You're gonna, and when you want to pass it off to me, you're going to yell a command. So something like, stick. Stick. So I put out my hand and extend it so okay. I know that you're passing. Because my momentum is focused forward. I don't want to look back. Uh-huh. You're so, leading. So the handoff is really important. Handoff is crucial. The timing of it is important. Okay, so if you're not ready, if you're uh, chilling out, and right. I'm running this direction, Correct. you're the younger generation, Correct. but you're really not ready to receive it, right. then you're going to miss the handoff. Correct. So it's on my end, as I see you approaching, what is your pace? If you're coming in strong, I need to get to your pace, so that means I need to get up to your level. 
If it looks like you're tired and you're burnt out, and Ooh, yeah. it's all day. I might take it a little slow. Okay, but, so the younger, the next generation then has to slow down so I'm in order to you. get what they need to get from the other generation. Correct. If they see that the other generation is not moving as fast. You got it. Correct. Okay. I'm adjusting to you. You're adjusting to me. I'm adjusting Because to you. you want what I have. Correct. So you can take it further than I've taken it. There you go. Uh-huh. Okay, okay. <laughs> this is good. This is good. All right, so let's demonstrate. Right. Let's demonstrate. And so we're running. I'm running. And now I say, stick, and I hand it to you, and you keep going. Ah, I like that. I like So both of us have to be engaged in the process. Correct. It just can't be me saying, hey, I'm discipling you. I'm going to help you with your money. And that. You have to actually do something. Correct. That's it. Uh-huh. And, and what about me? How if, what if I'm just like, give me that stick. I'm like, okay, I'm dying. I've been doing ministry for 30-something years. <laughs> what do you, what's, what's happening with you? So at that point, once you've passed it on, you're still running. You're still keeping your momentum, but then you're also cheering me on as I'm running, as I take on the baton from you. You're not, you're not disengaged at all. You're still engaged. But that's only if I'm thinking about it. Yes. <laughs> I hope you do well. <laughs> Aren't there a lot of older people, though, that are like, I, I bless you. I hope you do well. They're not engaged in the process of passing on what's necessary. But I'll pray for you. Run hard. No, I actually have to then do something. So we have to be engaged together in the process. Is there anything else about passing on the baton that we need to hear from you? I was going to say, that's, I mean, communication is big. The teamwork effort is, is, is a big part of it as well. And that's really the crucial part of it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and don't mess up the handoff, of course. Yeah. So that's great. Hey, man, thank you so much. All right, there you go. All right. So, wow. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. He didn't know that was coming. But, but that's exactly what we do sometimes. We die and we just drop the baton. What about we think about the legacy of those who are with us? We engage with them. They engage with us. Everybody plays their part. And then with our finances and with our faith and with our family, we pass it on. Did anybody receive anything from this message? All right. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that Jesus took time to pass on to us everything that heaven had for us. And we pray, oh God, that we would take everything that the Lord has given us and that we'd know how to pass it on for a legacy that would go much further than our lives on this earth. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Together, all of Bridgeway said, amen and amen.